of the Olympics, hmm. we're talking about, you know, not only was it seminal in the fact that I, I, I thought through, I said, I'm going to do 20 years of this, that wouldn't that be a great project? I, that was early on. I've gone way past that 20 years now, but it was, um, it was, it literally almost from the very beginning, which was very odd, I was enamored. I had grown up on my parents, you know, I told you about Life magazine and Saturday evening, but they also gave me a subscription to Sports Illustrated when I was young. So I grew up looking at football and baseball and sailing and all of those kinds of sports. Anyway, um, the Olympics, every four years you would get this, you know, this incredible series of, of, of magazines. And that was what I grew up on. And then when I started to go around to show my work early on, I realized that there was something really missing with with the way Sports Illustrated was covering football, baseball. One, it was doing only basic, basically only football, baseball, basketball, and hockey. You know, that was, the other sports didn't exist. Didn't realize that early on, but it was problematic. And the other was, when the Olympics came around, I could tell you exactly what they were gonna use on the cover of the magazine a year before they did. And that I thought was, here was this incredible, that level of sports, I mean at that level, the beauty of the sport just transcends anything that we could, as mortal humans could imagine. What those people are doing is just, just poetry. Sports Illustrated had two or three covers, you know, somebody holding up their gold medals on the cover, somebody coming across the tape winning the gold medal, or somebody running around the track with a, an American flag behind them. That has nothing to do with sports. Nothing. It's pure nationalism. It's just, you know, it's catering to all those people who, well, we won't get into that, the politics. And, we, and yet, at the same time, we have this, these beautiful... Also, I realized that we only dealt with, on TV or whatever, Americans. So if an American was not in the sport, we did not cover the sport. And I found that to be, because these are great athletes. So I started to realize that I had to photograph the real poetry of the sport. That was really incumbent upon me. And in a way, second of all, you're absolutely right. They have this roped off area where the New York Times and, and, and Sports Illustrated are all supposed to stand and they're supposed to be there to photograph. You know, they made plenty of room. The Olympic people knew that photography was what, if they didn't have photography, they didn't have TV, the Olympics didn't exist, so they had, but they had these huge hundreds of photographers all getting the same picture, all getting the same picture of the guy coming across the finish line so that it could be on the cover. So if he was, if he was from, if he was from Sri Lanka, he'd be on the cover of the Sri Lanka Times. If he was from China, he was on the cover of the Chinese um, uh, uh, monthly or whatever it was. My problem was that that was, we, I needed to cover all, anybody that was good. And the, uh, and the last part was that um, whenever I saw a group of photographers with the vest on that tell, you know, photo, whatever it is, and I tell my students this to this day, I say whenever I saw a group of photographers, I would turn around at 180 degrees and go the other way. I did not want their picture. So I was always looking to find another location. And that was, that's sort of what I based my photography, my Olympic photography on. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's, they, they, they try to, they, they try to accommodate the photographers to make sure they all have space, but they're all together getting that same photograph of the guy coming across the line.